I think we are live. I had an intro. Did you like, I need to redo that. That was just like a tester intro and I never redid it. So that's going to be it for now. I've got new cameras, new audio. Let me know if I need to adjust any of that. So many changes in here. So first to get started, I'm going to go over some of the changes I'm going to be making on this channel and how the live streams are going to be. And I'll give you a tour of the current camera setup because lots of changes. So starting out, we've got our main camera set up here. I'll show you this stuff first. We've got the full room. This one is going to change. I'm down here. Hi. I'm not super in love with how that one is because it's just as far as that camera will reach. I'm going to be changing that so you can see more of the studio. My goal is for you to feel like you're in here with me because that's what it feels like to me. Maybe because I'm a crazy person. We've got just zoom in on the easel. We've got the hound cam, of course. They're going to get an upgraded camera soon, too. Uh, like You can see how the edges are chopped off there. The camera's just weird, so we're going to be improving that. Very low volume. Okay, so there may be two issues with the volume. Let me turn this up. Let me know if that's any better. Um, let's see. Was the intro very low, too, or is it just my talking? Because I do have a way to adjust all of this. You're going to have to that worked? Okay. So that's going to be one of the things too. This microphone, it's an XLR. It has to be in my face. Like it's supposed to have better audio, although I need to do some work. I've got some more adjustments, but it has to be like three to five inches from your face. And I am not used to that. So that's going to be some adjusting for me. Okay, good. Um, let's see, turn up your device volume and volume in the, okay, you guys are good. So that was new. We've got, um, obviously the intro and outro. So yeah, we have a bunch of updates, the lighting in the background. I spent the last month setting all of this up. It has been, that's why there haven't been much in the way of edited videos. So that's part of what's new. Now, what's new, or as far as the equipment goes, I am going to be upgrading the easel camera again. This one is an upgrade from what I had, but it's going to, there's a better one. They're just not in stock for another month or two. So I'm waiting on that. But the reason that I'm going to be doing live streams again, I've, if you remember, I stopped doing them because they, um, YouTube kind of punishes your channel. The algorithm doesn't like the fact that most people only watch, like, let's say you watch 15 minutes. It's kind of a long time. But when they're, YouTube's like, oh, but it's a small percentage of the two hour that the stream was for. So it starts hurting your channel. So what I'm going to be doing is unlisting. As soon as this video is over, it's going to be unlisted. You'll still have access to it if you're on my email newsletter. So you should be on that if not, or on social media where I've posted it. You can still watch it if you click from there, but it won't be on my main part of my channel. I'm probably going to do an unlist, like a, a live stream playlist to make it easier for you guys to find. You'll also be able to find it from, through my website. But I'm also going to break these down into smaller things. So that brings me on to the next format, which will be very different than what we've done in the past. Before, when I did the lesson portion of the chat, the live stream, it was at the same time as trying to keep up with, with chat and answering questions. I'm not going to do that anymore. Now we're just going to focus on the art. Um, I've got Nick and and my brain shut down. Joseph. Wow. That was, that's not a good start if I already can't remember Joseph's name, but uh, they are going to be sending me messages through another app if there is a question that is related. So if you have something specific to charcoal or specific to this project, let me, you know, go ahead and ask in the chat and they're going to forward that on to me so I can try to keep up with that better. And that's, a huge thing going on now. So trying to keep a bit more on track. So it shouldn't take me more than an hour or so to get the actual artwork done. After that, we're going to do the question and answer. I'll be chatting with you guys, answering your questions, and they're still going to be sending me those questions too to try to keep it because it's hard for me. You guys know when I used to sit there and scroll and scroll and scroll and try to find which questions were for me, they're going to send relevant questions over. So that will hopefully be a bit more on track. And then I will also be able to edit all of these so I'm going to take the live stream, like let's say the art lesson. I'm going to make it its own video, upload that so it's searchable. You'll easily be able to find that. Or a question, like we're going to be talking a bit about AI paintings paintings. Um, AI art, I guess would be a better way to put it. We'll be chatting a bit about that later on in the stream. And so that will have its own, like I'll be able to edit it down now because it's so on topic and upload that. So it should give you guys, I'm hoping it'll just be a better experience for everybody. Assuming I learn how to use all of my stuff. Um, 
Joseph says, I don't know if it's a distance thing, but your audio does seem to fluctuate. And yeah, it's how I'm moving. I'm going to have to get used to this. So when I turn my head, like this is one that has to be so in your face to work well. So I will be dragging that around, trying to keep it where it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, this is going to take some practice. And then that's the other thing is that everything that I'm doing to here, uh, it's just going to take some practice figuring out what buttons to push. And it's a whole lot more involved than what it was. <laughs> so yeah, that's going to be fun. The mic, the thing with the mic and why I went with this one versus the one that I used to have, the one that I used to have was better as far as picking up audio in the entire room or, you know, if I moved around a bit, but it also picked up so much of the echo. The audio is just always terrible in here. So there we go. That is what's going on. The other thing I want to bring up is that we are having an auction. If you go to my website, lawcree.com or the link for the, the actual item, I'm going to be auctioning this off. So if you, you can start bidding right now, the bidding ends at 10 p.m. The only, this is kind of a beta testing thing of how the auction will work. I've never used this program. I mean, we, Joseph and Nick and I had tested it, but I did don't know how well it'll be for people to sign up and register. If there's a problem with registration during the, that's why I was trying to get people to register early. But if there's a problem with registration, I can't take care of it during the stream. So I apologize if someone's not able to get on to bid if they wanted to. We're just going to have to sort of see what happens. But if you do want to try it out with us, um, hopefully pay for the auction software that I bought to be able to do this, go ahead and head over to my website. Again, link is there. Nick, Nick linked it in the, um, the chat, and then it's in the video description as well. Or just go to lawcree.com, and it's on the front page, the link to do that. You, so you'll have to register, and then you can go back and bid. So that will be fun. Let me grab my phone. So I should – I'm going to try to keep up if I get – messages. So yeah, it looks like the auction has started. And then let me just pull this up really quick. Where did that go? So you don't even know what you're bidding on yet because you don't know how this is going to come out. Although if you've been here long enough, you have a pretty good idea of what my stuff looks like. Where is the button I'm looking for? See, this is what's going to be a challenge. Okay. So auction is going. I think we are ready. So for the first part portion of this video, we're just going to be working on the lesson. So if you're following along, you can get this reference photo over at my website. That link is in the video description as well or lockery.com, but it is over there. So first thing that I'm going to do is try to remember not to talk when my head is not faced at the camera. Step one. See, this is going to be a learning process for sure. Okay. Let's grab this. And I'm, I apologize for the auction. I can only do the U.S. right now. Just shipping is kind of, it, it's a whole thing. So for this first test, we're just doing this one for the U.S. It, this will be too big because it will come matted. And I'll show you that in just a second, actually. Hold on one second. It is, where is that? Okay, so this will set right over the artwork like this. This will come mat. Well, I'll give you a clean one. This mat's a bit of a hot mess right now, but I'll get a clean one. And it will come matted like that and ready to pop into an open frame. So that is what you're getting. I need a safer place to put that. If you have somebody that lives in the U.S. who's willing to ship it to you, you can have them vote for you. Or vote, not vote. Vote's not the right word. Okay. So I'm going to put my glass seam. I'm just taping that to my drawing board. You, when you're working with charcoal, or any, any medium you're working with, you don't want the oils of your skin on the artwork. It is not archival. Bonus for this, I'm leaving the background blank. If I smudge this or if I get my hand, let's say I wear hand lotion all the time. If I get lotion or let's say my hands were weirdly greasy. Let's pretend I cook and I had grease in my hand. I don't know. But if my hands got greasy and I touch that, it's going to leave a grease mark and that is not coming off. That would suck, especially being that I'm auctioning this. So what we're going to do is put something on there to protect it from smudges. It keeps your hands clean and it is going to protect the artwork or the paper from your non-archival skin grease. That's disgusting. Okay. For the charcoal pencils that I'm using, I'm using Generals. All the, the supplies that I'm using are listed in the video description. Those are, I think they're all affiliate links down there. I've got the Generals. This one is the extra soft. I'll also be using a medium one. And then I've got the Generals white. These are not behaving nicely. Oh, first bid. Yay. Two bids. Oh, that's fun. This is already fun. Okay, focus, Lisa. 
what I'm going to be doing, I've been having a hard time with my chart, my uh, pencil sharpeners are just not sharp enough. None of them I have here and they are just breaking. Charcoal is brittle. Charcoal breaks super, super easily anyway. So what I'm going to do is just shave. Actually, I'll, I'll sharpen some of it. Mostly I'll end up shaving this off with an X-Acto knife because that makes my life much easier. It's a little bit messier, but I don't end up breaking the lead quite as much. Okay, let's get that in there. And the reason, there's several different leads you can use with char, I just broke the lead anyway. Okay, we'll do a half sharpen and then sharpen the tip with that. But anyway, I wanna grab some other leads regardless. So there are several different types in these with the charcoal pencils. The the soft, the soft, extra soft, very, very similar. You're not going to notice a huge difference. It's going to smudge better. The softer the lead, the more it smudges out. So it's easier to get dark. It's easier to get it like into the crevice of all of this, which is really fun. It makes it, it's just fun to smudge and blend like that. Like it, it goes so easy, so fast. If you want finer detail, I'm going to switch to a more hard lead. No, that's extra soft too. Actually, I'm just use that one so I don't have to sharpen it. Um, let's see. We've got, do I only have extra soft in here? I know I bought a bunch of mediums. I may not have put them in here. I may have to go find them. Extra soft. Medium. There we go. So the medium I like for finer detail. It's a harder lead. It doesn't smudge as well. They're both pretty dark. Like when you're talking about charcoal, it's not a huge, huge de de uh, difference in how which one's darker. Like with graphite, you go with an 8B. It's going to be way darker than a 4H. With the charcoal, extra soft versus medium, the darkness is similar. Like not a huge difference. It's more an issue of which one's going to smudge and blend better. So we've got that. Let me grab a blending tool. These are not the ones I wanted at all. Where are those? You know what? You're just going to have to work. Mm, sure. Okay. So I'm going to start with my extra soft just to get, actually, I'll take it back. I'm going to start with the, what am I working on first? The beak. Let's zoom in on the beak. Okay, and I'm going to start with the, this one is the medium, just to sketch that out. You can see I can go right over where I had the white outline. It just covers it completely. So we're going to start shading that in. Let me move the mic again. This is seriously going to be the weirdest thing for me to get used to. I can brighten this up a bit too. Okay, so... Let's just sketch this in. I don't need, there is a fungus nut flying around here for my plants. I don't need this to be absolutely perfect. Close is good enough for this. And when I do charcoal sketches, I'm not going for so realistic that you can't tell that it's artwork. Like when I do colored pencils, sometimes you could, it, people have to take a double take. Like, was that a photograph? Is that artwork or uh, drawing? With this, it, you're not, or the same thing with some of the paintings. With this, it's obvious that it's a sketch. I like the sketchy look when I work with charcoal personal preference there. You can make charcoal look like a like an absolute photograph, but for me, this will work. So again, this is the medium, so it's not going to be as smudgy. Is that a word? I'm making it a word. We're just going to sketch that in. Whenever you're working on something, it's a good idea to work on one small area at a time. Don't try working on everything all at once where I'm doing the beak and then over the eye and then the feathers all like trying to say where all do I need that specific color and put that everywhere value I guess in this case don't that ends up getting very overwhelming and your work usually doesn't come out looking very good let's see if I can get I'm pretty sure this was the sharpener that was breaking them all before yep oh yeah because it still has the broken lead in it I'm a pro let's see if I can get this kind of sharpened before I use the exacto knife nope that one is, I have a feeling that this I've dropped and it is just broken all the way down. Um, yes, this is Kansami Tens. The, the supplies are listed all in the video description. Shaving this down. Just going back through it with the X-Acto knife. Uh, much better. It worked this time. Okay, so this one is the extra soft, and that's the other thing. The softer the lead, it is so much more prone to breaking. So yeah, it blends really nice, but it also breaks really nicely too. Okay, let's see. Our first Discord question from 
Let's see. D Lynn Creative Arts asks, what is your opinion on charcoal powder? And will the link to the live stream be available on Patreon? Ooh, I'll put it on Patreon for you. Somebody remind me if I forget. Um, you've got it in your email newsletter. It's on my website. It's on, it'll be in a few locations, but remind me if I don't, somebody, if you can remind me, I always say that and I always forget. Um, I should get that on Patreon too. I didn't. So I'm always temp like torn on should I upload it that or post it to Patreon because I've had people misunderstand and think that the live streams on Patreon are one of your Patreon rewards. They're not. They're for everybody. But people get like complain that, well, I don't like those. I like the regular ones. Well, I'm doing the regular ones too. This is just a bonus. So yeah, I wasn't sure, but you're right. I probably should be posting that so you guys can find it easier. That's a good idea. I will do that. Maybe what I'll do too is start putting the live stream – I'm trying to think of it. I'm constantly working on ideas on how to improve these. I've got a lot of ideas. So let's go through here. Actually, speaking of Patreon, I actually have Patreon ads. So wait, how would you word that? Today's video is brought to you by our sponsor, who's me. So here, I can actually show you while I'm thinking about it, an ad. So Matt, help me out with these. Our first ad, huh? I'm going to keep going until I succeed or die. Harry Potter. Um, that looks legit. My, my classes are legit. These ads may not be. We'll see how that goes throughout the live stream because I've got a few of them. Anyway. Okay, back to the artwork. Now I'm going to go ahead and blend the white. We'll just smudge right into that gray. So you can see I pulled the black. If you've got your reference photo, way farther than it needs to be, but it doesn't matter because they're going to smudge together. Pay attention to where you want things to be really light. Oh, and charcoal powder. So the charcoal powder, yes, it's wonderful. If you've got it, use it. I need to get some. I'm out. I've used it. It's so nice to work with. Not so much on something like little details, but for like a big blurring of a background, wonderful. I definitely need to pick some up. Now, when I use a blending tool like this, this one's actually previously for uh, graphite, so it's not going to work as well. But I keep one end for the white pencil and one end for the black. It just makes it easier so I'm not overly like bleeding the two into each other where I don't want it. Okay. So see how those just smudge really nice. Now another thing, do I have one down here? Let me see. I have this cool thing and I need to put it on. It's all dirty from being under the easel. There's some dog hair on this. Um, they have these cool little rocket ship looking things. What is it? A Giotto? I don't know. I need to get a link for you guys. Um, but you can use this instead of blowing on the work and accidentally spitting on it, which also not archival and it does stay in the work. I can blow the dust off with that. So those are pretty handy. Or a, I don't know where mine is, a drafting brush works too. Okay. So we're just going to keep smudging on here. And I'm not worrying about the detail. The detail can come on top of this. I just want to get this mostly blocked in. And I can use the, the charcoal that's already on the, the shading tool. It picked some of that up so I can smudge some of it just with, what, oops, wrong thing, with what's there. I don't have to always add charcoal like from the pencil to the paper. Sometimes just what's on your shading tool will be enough. We'll go ahead and pull this up. And you're just going to work back and forth layer until it looks good. And remember, if you don't want it to smudge as much, switch over to your medium pencil. The soft is good for the really smudgy areas. You can also use the charcoal blocks. I've got some of those for bigger areas. Those are really time saving too. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of get a base layer on the entire beak and then I'll go on top and put in some details. Now notice uh, as I move this pencil, I'm moving it the direction of the beak so that if I end up with lines, sketchy lines, which I will, this will keep those lines Go, it'll just look like it's a part of the beak. Um, if I have a line going the wrong direction, it's going to look a little weird if that stays in. We've got another question coming in. Um, Paul said, is it necessary to seal charcoal drawings with fixative? What happens if we don't seal them? 
everyone's definition of necessary is gonna be a bit different on this. I would certainly recommend it and I will be doing that with Spectrafix. So let me grab the, after I get a few layers, I will be misting it with Spectrafix. And then this is actually, show you better. So this is the product that I use and I put it in a fine mist sprayer. And the reason for that is if you just spray out of the bottle it comes in, it you have heavy droplets come out that can sometimes leave a mark. This is more likely to give you very soft, like an even, even mist. So it's better for that. But um, if you don't, so charcoal, same thing with pastel. Pastel artists are going to have the same thing. I know a lot of pastel artists who don't seal their stuff. I don't agree with it because over the years that will start to settle. And if you talk to a framer as the artwork has um, sat framed like behind glass, you'll start seeing a powder from the pastel or in this case charcoal on the mat. And that's going to happen even with a fixative. Without a fixative is even worse. It's constantly kind of falling off the paper. It's not all that permanent. So I want to use personally, it's a must for me. I want to use something that's going to make that charcoal adhere to the paper as long term as possible. So you're going to get different answers from different artists for sure. One of the negatives of using a fixative is it can darken it up a lot depending on which fixative you use. That's why I use Spectrafix. I don't find that it darkens anything. If it does, it's very, very little. Or if I put it on way too heavy and you'll see me spray it tonight. But this will um, help keep it long, the work in good condition long term. So I, is it a must? Eh, depends on who you ask. For me, yes. For, uh, for many, many others, no. So I wouldn't even say it's like for sure a right or a wrong answer. I'm just not comfortable selling something that I don't feel is going to last long term enough. So now that we've got our base in here, we can go ahead and start in on doing um, details. We can get the, the brighter highlights. And again, we don't need this to look like a, a photograph. I'm not going that detailed. It's going to have a sketchier look. But we also want it realistic. We're definitely going for realism here. So... We want to pay attention, and in order to do that, you've got a few things. Keep your edges clean. Keep So like the beak, the edges here, we want that nice and clean. The other thing is pay attention to your values. That's going to make a bigger difference in your artwork looking realistic than anything else. Dark's dark enough. Light's light enough. This is going to give you that more realistic look. It also makes the work more interesting to look at. But we're going to go through now and get some of these little details, little sketchy marks on the beak. The beak is similar to fingernails. If your fingernails start to kind of peel up, kind of how bird's beaks are. So if you think of it like that, gives you an idea of what we're trying to accomplish there. Some little details. Now, I don't want to make it sound like charcoal can't do super, super real, like super photorealistic. It can. Like you can go as detailed as you want. I personally, when I use it, like it for that fast, looser look, that more artsy look. And that is completely personal preference. Now, don't overblend. That's another thing. We don't want to lose our light. We want to make sure we see where there are lights and darks. One thing that a lot of people will do is they learn to blend, and then they think everything needs to be really, really blended, and then you lose, like, you lose it. You, you don't have your lights and your darks anymore. So I think a few little lines coming the direction of the beak. I may come through and do additional work later, but that's about, oh no, I lied. A little bit in here. And I would rather see you get super, super, um, like hype your contrast up. Your dark's a little too dark. Your light's a little too light. I would rather see that than boring mid-range where it feels safe. It's, it's boring. Get those darks darker, those lights lighter. That's going to look better. Okay. Now I'm using my extra soft. I'll get a little bit into that dark, dark spot. Smudge that out a bit. And that's actually a little bit too, a little bit darker than what I want. I'm going to take the white right on top of it. The cool thing with charcoal, this is such a good medium. If you're learning to do any anything, let's say you're practicing feathers, practicing dog fur, practicing portraits, charcoal is such a fast medium that it makes it very easy to get the hang of these things because you can. It, it's forgiving. It's fast and forgiving. So you screw something up, just go back over it. It's not a big deal. Whereas like oil painting, you've got a dry time and smudging and it just, it's a whole thing or any other medium. I mean, it's always going to be a whole thing trying to fix mistakes. Charcoal is just so forgiving. So it's really good for practicing. 
and obviously finished art. I feel like I'm a charcoal salesperson today. All the great things. I just, it, it's funny because I used to use it all the time. It was one of my primary mediums and I stopped because I felt it was really messy. I think it was the paper I was using. I don't know. I'm back in love with it again. So we've got a highlight over the nose here or the nostril. We've got, this needs to be a lot brighter. So this entire area over the beak should be lighter than the majority of the beak itself. This is that skin around it. Again, don't feel like everything needs to be overly blended. It's okay if you have that sketchy look. Now we need to get some of the shading. Actually, I'm gonna switch over to my medium pencil so I can get better detail or cleaner detail. Inside of his nose here. I really like the white um, pencils. These ones hold uh, their point a lot better. Okay, let's go back to the medium. I'm just going to clean up some of these edges a little bit. Again, it doesn't need to be perfect, but we do want it to be close. Okay, I'm going to leave that for a bit because I do need to put the lines for the feathers coming in, but I need what's next to it in first. So we're going to let that set for a bit. Let's come over here. I'm going to use the medium again. I need to sharpen this first. Let's see, do I want to risk that sharpener? This is probably going to be a mistake. If the sharpener works, it's so much easier. But when it doesn't, and it just keeps breaking. It's very frustrating. Okay, so I'm going to kind of get this wispy look, moving these feathers back along this edge. We can get a few little highlights with white in there. Not too much. Okay. And let me move my reference photo. See what area do we want to work on? Let's pull just around the forehead area and then I'm going to skip over to the eye and work out from there. So same thing, we're just going to keep this kind of sketchy. Make sure it's going the right direction. Let the gray of the paper too. Don't feel like you need to cover all of the paper. We're using toned or colored paper. Let it work for you. That's a good thing. It's one of the benefits of using the colored paper. Let it do it like it's doing some of your work for you. Let it. Whoa, you guys are actually like, wow, you guys are really bidding on this. It makes me, gives me some pressure on, I need to make sure this is really good. And I'm just going to lightly go over that. But as I move the shading tool, I'm going to move it in the direction of those feathers. And I'm going to leave that for now. That kind of blocks in. Yeah, I'm going to skip over and work on the eye a bit and then work my way out. There's no real reason. You can work from one area all the way over if you want to. For me, I usually will jump in over to the eye and then work my way out once I get around the beak done. I don't have a good reason for you on that. It's just how I always do it. Okay, so let's block in where we know the pupil is going to be. I don't have a lot of detail drawn in here, so I've got to pay attention to what I'm doing. I'm going to have to add a whole bunch. One of the things you can do, I've heard people say they didn't like to work in charcoal or pastels for the sole purpose. Now, I'm not a pastel person. Those are too messy for me. But um, just because the scratchy sound it made drove some people crazy, you can put on headphones. You won't even hear it if you put on music and headphones. I used to do that, not because I was trying to hide the sound. I was honestly just not aware it made a sound. So when people were complaining about that, I was kind of surprised because I had not experienced that. But it was because the headphones. So we'll darken that. Let's 
smooth out the center. Now, another cool thing you can do, and I'm not set up to do that right now. I don't, do I have any over here? You can take a water or a paintbrush with water and go over it and make a really clean edge. So if you have something you want really sharp, just a little bit of water on a paintbrush, like a, a filbert or not a filbert, a tackle and bristle brush are my favorites for that. Just a little bit of water and you can get really crisp edges. Okay, looks like we've got another question. Um, Sheila asks, what do you think of using velour like a velvet surface? I have never played on that. I've never used that. So I can't give an opinion one way or another on that. I've seen some really neat work done on it, but it's not something I've tried. I'm just going to smudge what's already there. Yeah, it's definitely something I'd like to try. I did the, um, what is it, vellum? that or no it was drafting film something like that I used that with colored pencil that was fun I'd like to try more with it I just never got around to it it's kind of blocking in about where things are gonna go and then I'll, I'll clean up and sharpen things up as we move on So far, this seems to be working well with the Discord and you guys sending me the messages, um, having the mom send the messages. Oops, see, look, I screwed up. I touched it, you just smudge it out, not even a problem. So forgiving. Like there's really nothing besides ripping your paper you can do that wouldn't you couldn't fix. going to smudge that around. Okay, let's start getting a little bit of that highlight in there. Make sure you get a lot of variation in those values. That mid-range there's, and I've told this story many times, but it's still relevant. Back when I used to be on, uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but there was an Italian greyhound forum when I used to show my dogs. I, w I sold a lot of um, pet portraits through that site. And there were a few other artists that were really amazing. And there was one woman, and she was very good. I mean, she was so accurate, but she didn't have any super light lights or dark darks. Mostly, she'd get some lights, but mostly her stuff was just complete mid-range boring to look at and it was weird because she was so skilled her work was so good but she just didn't get the attention some of the other artists who really didn't have the technical skill that she did but it was boring to look at get those values in there that is going to make such a difference in somebody continuing to look at your work I mean if you've got your stuff at a gallery and it's up against a lot of other artists you're trying to get people to look at your work for as long as possible get that contrast And right now we're just building form. One of the ways I like to explain it when you were doing something like this, think of it as sculpting. We th have a tendency to look at drawing or working in something like this as it's just drawing, it's flat. Yeah, but we're trying to make it not look flat. We're sculpting, we're creating form and shadows and you that is what we're doing as we build up. The other thing on this, I like to let, I'm working on the rough side of the paper. I like to let some of that texture like really work for me on creating detail. Like this area of the skin by the eye is really kind of bumpy. Let it be bumpy. That's actually a good thing. Um, let it, oops, that's the wrong one. Whoops, that was not what I meant to hit. Hold on. There's what I meant to hit. Let's get, let you see that a little bit closer. But we got this really rough texture in a lot of this. Let it be there on some of this, especially around the skin where we want it to be rough. Let it stay that way. Don't try to smooth every single thing out on this. If you want something really, really smooth, then a different paper or a different medium might be better. But for this, let that roughness work for you. Let it create some of that really interesting texture. We got some little dots coming through here.
So for those of you who are working on or bidding on the auction, is that working out for you guys okay? Is the app, like, everything going smooth? It had good reviews, and our test went well once I figured out how to set it up. That took all day. And I'm going to clean this up, and we're going to start pulling some detail right around the edge. It's got these little eyelash dot guys here so let's just put some dots in there now the areas that i'm working right now these are the areas that are going to by a long shot take the longest that wasn't the button i meant to hit that's going to take the longest by far the eye the beak this is all that tiny detail the rest of this will feel like it goes really fast once we get through this section And then once we get a, a kind of loose base, we can come in and clean stuff up a bit. I'm going to lighten up just a bit around the bottom here. I don't want to overblend. I really like how sketchy that is. Okay. I'm going to pull this shadow down, though. Keep that edge clean. Okay. I'm going to now start working on the feathers around the head. So I don't need to have my hand quite as stable, so I can go ahead and kind of move the paper out of the way, and my hand will be more at a distance as I work here. So let's actually zoom my reference photo out, have some chai tea. Hopefully it's not still too hot. Are the boys doing well? Yep, they're energetic as always. So that's going well. Okay. Extra soft is what I'm looking for. Where is that pencil? There we go. So we've got these this small area in here. And it doesn't really matter if you do the black pencil first or the white. It's not going to make a huge difference. And as I move this, I want to make sure that these feathers are going the right direction. Don't I don't want to just scribble this in. I think this is the noise that a lot of people disliked on that were, not a lot, but a handful of people were complaining about it. So I wonder how many of you wouldn't have even noticed the annoying noise had I not pointed it out. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Okay. Let's just get this whole dark area mapped out. This, I'm going to be more solid. This doesn't have a whole lot of feathers in there. I'm going to blend it anyway. So we're just holding the pencil to the side. A uh, charcoal block would be faster and actually be good for that, but I forgot to put some out. Now, don't get too worked up on making every feather exact it's not going to make the work better. Close is close enough. Okay, let's blend that a bit. So one of the things I was thinking about doing for these live streams to make them a little bit maybe more fun or interesting is have every time somebody signs up for Patreon or somebody, a super chat or something like that, or bids on the auction, have like lights go on and the boys get a treat but I haven't figured out how to make that happen that would notify me or like maybe when we hit a certain threshold like when there's for every ten dollars worth of super chats or something the boys get a treat so that would be kind of fun but I haven't really I was adding so much to these streams that I I have not sorted out all of the things I want to do for them so they should keep getting more fun and interesting as I get the hang of everything What are you doing? I hear noises over there. Oh, no, I think it's actually not even them. I think it's my husband in the other room. I thought the boys were making weird noises. Okay, so just this nice big black. We're just kind of blocking in that, and then we've got another area here. I'm going to go ahead and block that in, and then we're going to go in and do what I was talking about with creating the feathers and paying attention to the direction they go in.
I'll just get those darkest areas blended. Let's see. We've got some of the dark through here. We'll go ahead and pull that down. And I'm trying to look at the reference photo. Let's say you came out here. Then there was the really bright area here. I think this could come down a little further. See how you can just rework an area? Like it's just crazy to me how easy, when you're used to working in colored pencil, it is just crazy how easy it is to make adjustments and changes when you're working in, in, um, in charcoal. We're just going to use what's on the brush here. See, this is where that charcoal powder, that would actually come in handy for something like this, just to shade in loosely. This whole area is actually really dark too, so let's go ahead and get that in there. And then when these start building the shading tools, if they start building more charcoal than what you want, I just keep an old rag, or in this case, it's a Viva paper towel, and just wipe it off. It'll clean it up just fine. You don't need to, actually, that's a good thing to talk about. So with these, people will think that they you need to keep them sharp, and I've seen people actually run these through a pencil sharpener. Don't do that, you ruin them. Or the sandpaper blocks that you get, oh, do I have any over here? Yeah, I do. These, not for sharpening your blending tool. These are for sharpening or getting your pencils to a finer point. Your pencils, well, any pencil. Not these. These, not these. So don't, don't, just don't. That will actually ruin it. What happens when you use that on one of these is it makes this like a fluff ball. It's just fuzzy. It's got lines through it. And so when you go to shade, it doesn't shade quite right. It, it just, you ruin them. These don't need to be sharp. And if it gets to the point where it's so dull and you wish it was pointy again, get a new one. They're like 20 cents or 50 cents. I don't know how much they are. They're cheap. You get a pack of them for not much. They're very, very inexpensive. So I usually will have some that are more dull, some that are more sharp, but don't, sharpening them is just wasting them. It, it, you're not going to get the results that you're thinking you will. So let's go through here. I'm keeping an eye on, yay, another bid on the auction. I'm keeping an eye on that. It just, it's um, really interesting watching how that goes, being this is the first one. I'm not sure if I should do auctions during the week on my website. Guys, let me know if you, you think that would be fun. I don't even think it would be worth, I don't think enough people go to the website. Maybe that would be a way to encourage people to, but it was something I was considering. Mostly because I paid for the software, so I feel like I really need to get my use out of it. That's a good reason to use something, right? It's actually what I do with art supplies all the time, too. I've had people, what was it I bought recently? I don't remember what it was. I don't know if it was a camera or what, it, what was it? But I remember somebody saying, well, maybe you should get the, the less expensive version. And I was like, nope, I'm getting the one that I know I want to end with, and I'm going to make myself, I think it was watercolor. It's like, I will, I'm getting the best, and I'm going to make myself use them because I spent too much money to not. Okay, we're getting some good shadows in here and then we can start, like this This is the fun part that's fun to me, how fast it will just start looking better once we get these base layers in. Got this one on our shoulder here. You can see how I'm just, I'm mainly just blocking in my general shadows. Now you can break this up into a smaller area too. You don't have to kind of fill in all of the darker shadows at once. I find it to be easier because this next step I kind of do all at once, which almost sounds like it's contradictory to what I was saying earlier in the video about um, working on one small section at a time. Yeah, for the detail stuff. But for this, I can just map out where my general lights and darks go for this layer. We've got, let's see, we've got a lot of detailing in here on the beak. Let's see that. We've got more white that comes down there. We'll go ahead and shade that in. Let's 
Okay. I think we're almost at the point where we can start doing the detail stuff. Before we do that, let's go ahead and take a look at another ad from our sponsor, me. I'm the, I'm, I'm the sponsor. So let's see what ad Matt helped me with next. Not even these lessons could help my acting skills. I mean, I'm not mad about that one. That That's pretty accurate, even though she didn't give me very good stars. But, you know, it's it's accurate. Okay. My, my sponsored ads are not very good. The point is, sign up to Patreon for as little as $4 a month. You get access to all of my longer tutorials. Maybe I should just verbally tell you guys about the ad or, you know, what I, I'm promoting versus my... Um, Matt helping me with reviews. Don't know where he got those reviews from. Okay. So now we've got a little bit, actually, I want to do a little bit more shading here, pulling that down. Okay. So I'm going to go and start back up with the head. And this is just so, keep it kind of loose. Don't feel like you need to make every little thing exact. Close is close enough. And this is where I love, like if you are struggling with dog hair, feathers, anything, try doing it in charcoal. You'll go through it very quickly and you can start getting the motion, the movement of the feathers, the movement of the, the fur. Let's say you're having a hard time with water, making water look natural or moving in a stream. Practice it with charcoal. You can very quickly try a bunch of things that don't work. So you learn not to do those things again. Doing Making mistakes is a huge part of learning to improve things anyway. But you can move on to the parts that go like figuring out what makes things work faster. So definitely a really good medium for getting the hang of that. But again, here, I'm worrying about the movement of the feathers. Which direction are they going in? See how they almost, I want to say scale, but then I don't because it does look kind of like the scales of a fish coming through. However, People have a tendency to overdo that and make little loops that look like kid scales on fishes or how a kid would do it. And that is not, it's not cute. Don't do that. So when I say scale, don't take it too literally. Okay. So we've got a really bright area here. Notice how it curves this direction. Another thing to point out, when you're working with anything that's like nature, you're not going to have a lot of really straight lines. Um, the, the straight lines are going to be man-made things, brick walls, walls, uh, fences, that sort of thing. But when you get into nature, whether it be feathers, grass, trees, even tree trunks, they're very rarely perfectly straight. Everything here I'm doing is at least slightly curved. Not going to be a lot of really straight lines. Now watch these feathers too. They start to move almost in these rows. And this is what I was talking about, where you're, you're just getting the hang of the movement there. Let some of the dark show through. We're not trying to cover that all the way. And we're going to come back and add even more darks in on top of that. So, so don't worry about that not being dark enough yet. But see how these are clumped? And this is going to be similar if you're doing animal fur. Um, any animal fur, the, you'll get these clumps of fur, or in this case, feathers, not, not just individual strands. You do individual strands, it looks like confetti. It's not so cute. So as we move here, look at how it changes direction again. Now these are getting too light, so I will definitely blend these to tone it down. Notice how often I'm looking at my reference photo, just constantly. You should spend more time looking at your reference photo than you do your actual artwork. Oh good, my neighbor's dogs are out barking. That's not distracting at all. Can you guys hear it when they bark out there? So now this, see how this whole area right now is the same value. Light is the same everywhere. That's something that we'll be correcting as we go through. Pretty much still just blocking out where the lights and darks go. 
we wouldn't want to leave it that way right now by leaving it where it's the brightness or light and versus dark is the same all the way through it makes it look very very flat besides just being incorrect altogether Pull those out, follow the direction. And it's so easy to make a few pencil strokes and think you've got like, I made a couple strokes and it looked perfect. I'll just repeat that everywhere. No, don't, whoops, I just messed up my OBS. There we go. Don't, no, don't do that. Um, really watch that reference photo. These guys are really short in here. And actually, I probably should have put the darks in first. I'm going to have to go back through with darks. Not that it's a huge deal which one goes first, but yeah. We've got more little dots in here where it's super short. And just like the, the little hairs right there are facing at the viewer. And so you're just getting the tips, the dots. That's what we're doing um, there. And you'll do that a lot when you do animal fur, too wherever the fur is aimed like usually i'll see it like under a, a cheetah under the ear that fur will be aimed if they're looking at this this way that fur will be aimed at the viewer you get a lot of dots dots are your friend You can really see all of my values just kind of disappearing right now. We'll bring that back. I'm getting a little too curved there. Talked about not wanting too many straight lines. I'm overdoing it. And one of the methods that a lot of people like to do for getting the drawing on their, their piece is to use the grid method. You can use any method you want to get it on there. I don't like the grid, though, because usually, it is just so common for people who use the grid method. Their finished result has this very boxy square look. Start noticing that. There's an artist I follow on Instagram. She's amazing. But her work is too angular. Everything is. And it's like, it's weird because the work is so realistic to see those angular lines. And you might say, oh, it's stylized. No, that's just typical of people who, excuse me, who use a grid method. So I really don't like that. I would rather see you if you want to freehand, freehand on something else than use a projector or a um, tracing and transfer paper to transfer the image to the, the piece to keep it clean or just trace in general. But the I don't like the end result that most people get using the grid. Occasionally, someone will do a great job with it and it works really well for them. It seems like the smaller the grid, the worse it is, the more angular the artist tends to come out with. But it's a really weird phenomenon I've noticed with people who are using that grid method. You don't, there's like the roundness that we're getting that is missing in a lot of it. Like it's kind of round, but it's also kind of angular. It's a very odd thing. So it's not something that I like, I like to see students. I mean, use whatever method you enjoy. That really is what matters more than anything. But I, as far as getting better results, I really don't like the results most to get using the grid method. It's really obvious on portraits. It's a very odd, like, very odd look. We've got this really light area in here. We can just fill some of these in more solid. You don't have to push very hard with this pencil. Actually, you wouldn't want to because it'll probably break on you. Okay, we've got a question from the Hedgehog. What's an alternative to those grids using a 9H pencil? What do you, what do you mean? An alternative? I don't, 
I don't know how the pencil and the grid is relating to each other. Um, I would say if you wanted to freehand, freehand on another piece of paper, then use tracing paper, trace it, and then transfer it so you get a clean transfer to your image. Um, that way you don't have eraser marks and damage that way. Or you can freehand it on something else and use a projector to project it onto the image. Or you can just project and trace it. That works too. Any method that you like to use is fine. It's just that the, that grid, it is the most... If any of you have done the grid and you know what I'm talking about and you've had that result happen with you and are willing to let me show in a video, please send it to me because I don't want to just take random people's art off the internet, obviously, and be like, this is what I'm talking about. But, um, I mean, you can just look at artists who are using grid method. But, yeah, it, I don't – the 9H pencils – I wouldn't draw with a 9H. That's going to be really scratchy. That's too light and it's really scratchy and it's going to be more likely to indent your paper or leave like a little scratch. Like I don't use a 9H very often. That's for very light areas and you can almost not see it at all. So I wouldn't say that's the ideal alternative. Lesson learned, iced cha latte next time, not a, it is too hot in here for a hot drink. That probably just annoyed all of you guys up north, huh? Okay. So as we move in here, you'll see this will start overlapping those dark areas. Once I get most of this mapped out, we'll start working on the values and correcting that. I do want to smudge some of this out now. Just soften that up. Yeah, and I'm sure some people will get annoyed and think of artists there they themselves have a great result with with the grid method. Yeah, it can happen. It's just so common to have people for some reason follow this real boxy look. So I'm not saying it's not possible. Any method can get you something good. It just, I think that causes more problems than helps. And it's not an issue of, oh, it's cheating. Because I've heard people do that too, where they say any any method you use, oh, that's cheating. It's not cheating. Any method you use, what, I don't care if you trace, it's art. Whatever creates good art is what I'm all for. That's my problem with the grid method. I don't feel it really creates that like as good as you could get using other methods. Okay, I'm trying to go through this. I, If you're following along, you may want to go a bit slower than what I'm doing. I want to try to get this done a little bit, get caught up a bit more. Probably should have done a slightly smaller project. Because we definitely need time to go through the Q&As, and I want to talk about the AI art. One of the things you may notice me doing too a lot as I'm working, I keep squinting at it. it. It's the equivalent of looking at it from a distance to see what it, like, it gives you the same effect. Is there something I need to adjust? Is something standing out too much? Is my movement going right? And this just starts getting bigger, so I'm going to use my pencil to the side here. This isn't so much with the little details. I'm excited. We're almost to my favorite part where it starts getting the little details and working on values. I just, it's my favorite. I always love the end of these. And I don't want a ton of detail down here because I want to keep the attention more towards the face. So as I move out, I start using less and less detail and I'll start intentionally smudging things out a bit more. Um, what are you here? We've got a little bit of feathers. Other lines. So this is the photo. You can see a lot more crisp lines in here. I don't want mine to be that crisp. I want this to be much softer. Remember, you're an artist. You are not a photocopier. It doesn't need to be exact. You want to make yours 
you put your signature essentially on it, your style. What do you like the look of? Like when I work with charcoal, I love that sketchy feel. I want that. And I like the way that I can soften things out as I move away from the face. That's one of the fun things I get to do as an artist versus taking a photo. Not so easy to do. Or I mean, you can, I guess you can Photoshop it, but... Okay, smudge some of these, and we are almost at the fun part of making it look good. So close. And you can see, when we zoom in here, you can see the, the, a lot of the dots, the, the texture from the paper. Let it show. Don't feel like everything has to be blended smooth. I love that look when it comes to charcoal. This is interesting. YouTube is giving me notifications of this would be a good time to, to play an ad, which is new. That didn't used to do that. It's one where they play their ad where I would make money from that. But instead, why didn't I tell you a little bit about Patreon? who is our sponsor for today. And by Patreon, I mean my Patreon. If you are not already signed up for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. I have over 300 available immediately when you sign up and it, other bonuses and such. And I can show you what others are saying about it. Team Lacree, obviously. I'm a dork. Okay, we'll go back to work. Hey, on the, this case, YouTube is the one who told me I should play an ad. They didn't say their ad. I think it was implied, but actually, let me close their pop-up of trying to get me to play their ad. I'd rather you guys be stuck with my, my stupid cheesy ads than YouTube ads. Okay. Now we are on to what I call the fun part. We're going to just kind of go over everything and just improve whether it be details, values, all of that stuff, edges. Actually, I do want to get a little, um, hold on, what is the email? Oh, new bid on the auction. You've got one hour to go. Well, 90, no, that's not how many minutes is in an hour. You have 58 minutes left to bid. If you are going to bid, what am I looking for? One second. Here, I can show you the full room. So I have a water brush and I'm gonna use this just around the edges of the eyes where I want it to be a little bit more crisp, just a little. Oh, this is not a good brush though. Hold on, I need a different brush. That one's kind of flat. Oh, this one will work after I get the color out of it. Apparently, I used it on watercolor. And you do not want a lot of water to do this. Just a little. There are just a few areas that are a bit bumpier than what I want it to be. I know I was just saying that bumps are good. Yeah, but not all of them. Just a few clean edges and it just smooths that out. I also want to do that over here, just a little. It won't be that dark when it dries. Okay. That's really it for where I wanted this super, super like sharp, sharp edge. Whoops, hitting the camera. Hold on, how bad did I hit that? Yeah, that's probably, there we go. Okay. So now values, let's start with a beak. Actually be careful too. Um, now that I think about it, I'm gonna wait since I used water here while I'm okay, I'm not that close. You don't want to, wherever it's wet, do not move the pencil over it. You'll damage the paper and not get results that are very cute. So I can work on areas around that now. So we've got some lighter areas here. And then I want to actually, let me move the paper out of the way. Okay. 
Okay. So now I've got a lot of these darker areas in here. I'm just going to move my pencil under. If you look at the reference photo, it's kind of under a lot of the white areas. So I'm going to focus on that, but let it blend into the white a little too, so that those get toned down. I'm using the medium. I want the soft. There we go. See, it's a little darker than the medium, not a ton. But I want to be able to smudge this a bit better, and that's why I wanted the main reason I want to use the soft here. Smooth that out so you can see on that reference photo, this whole area should be a little bit darker. I can actually just smudge over a lot of that. Look how it softens that out so nicely. Okay. We've got a few darker bits in here. Some of these longer lines. And at this point, most of what I may smudge, it's just a little bit. It just, you'll see here, just a couple strokes, just soften it. I'm not doing what we did in the beginning where I had to keep reworking the area over and over again to really smooth that out. We've already done that. This is just a little bit here and there to soften the transition. This needs to be sharpened. Which one is this? Oh, good. I get to play with razor blades again. That's always a scary idea. I hate to scratch my nose or my face because I'm pretty sure I have charcoal on my fingers, so I'm probably leaving marks all over. That'll be cute. Okay. Once you've worked in charcoal, check your face in the mirror before you leave the house. People will have questions. Especially if you're using the white pencil. This whole area needs actually a decent amount more detail. Let's pull that white down. It needs to overlap here a bit. We'll smooth that out. I'm gonna use the medium just for this area in here. We've got this bit of detailing. And actually here is way too dark. So I'm gonna very lightly go over it with the white pencil. I don't wanna make it as white as the other areas, but I do wanna lighten it up just a bit. Those are seriously the laziest dogs. Nothing, no movement at all. Okay, another thing that we've got are all the little hairs in through here. So we'll grab the medium, start pulling these longer guys. Watch where these curve. Actually, I need to lighten this whole area up. I'm just gonna use the side of the pencil. I'm gonna smudge that and then I'll come on top with the um, black. Let's clean this up. Actually, I think it can go even a lot lighter Let's push a little bit harder. Now, luckily this pencil is not super sharp right now, so I can push it pretty hard without it breaking. Okay. Blend that a bit. I wanna make sure this is clean.
And then we're going to take that medium. If you have any questions you want to chat about once we get to the chat section, go. you can put them in now. Um, I think, actually, I didn't check if Nick and, and uh, Joseph, why do I keep doing that? I keep stalling on Joseph's name. Um, if they, they should be able to copy and paste it and save it for later once we open questions up. So if you think of something, you can put it in, I think, unless they tell us otherwise. little hairs in here. See why we needed the bottom area to be so light first. Oh good, we've got, um, Nick said he's been saving questions, perfect. So I am not ignoring, well actually I am ignoring him, I'm actually, that's literally what I'm doing is ignoring you right now and that's the correct word of the word literal, but I'm actually ignoring you because I'm not looking at chat, but um, I will be getting to it. It's, I'm not, I'm not trying to do it to be rude, I'm trying, I'm trying to focus this time so we can get an actual art lesson. See how we start building these details and already what a difference we're starting to see. This area needs to be a lot lighter. That's another tip when it comes to values. If you have an area that doesn't feel like it's getting dark enough, like right here was not getting dark enough, um, this area there, it's because what was next to it wasn't light enough. I couldn't go darker than that. I had to lighten up what was next to it. All these little guys back here. Now this is all back to what I was saying before, where if it's too light, that'll um, flatten it out. So we'll just lightly go over that. I needed the detail. I just don't want it to be that much brighter than the other areas. Yeah, that's the extra soft. Okay, this is, there we go. And I don't have the paper there, but my hands are not resting on it anymore. So that's why I'm able to get away with that. How many of you are cringing at that sound right now? That's even getting a little bit annoying for me. I'm not super sen sensitive to that. Okay. Softening that out. I'm not worrying about which direction it goes because I just want it soft in general here. Get a little bit of detailing on the feathers just around the edges. This is a fun thing too. If you've not done charcoal, if you like to do art shows, this is something that I did there where I could sit and draw something, like spend maybe a half an hour on something and sell it for 40 bucks, $50. Um, I had people offer a lot more depending on what I was doing. It depends on how it comes out, obviously. But you can, it can be a way to attract people to your booth. You don't have to bring all your painting supplies. Your, I mean, gosh, if I bring everything I need for colored pencil paint, any other medium, it's a ton of stuff. And I'm not dragging that along with the artwork that I'm trying to sell. I can bring this though. This is an easy setup. What, three, four pencils, maybe a couple extra in case I break some, because I'm going to break some. Um, my Spectrafix and some paper. And it was, I was doing jellyfish, so I didn't even have to have anything really pre-drawn out. Um, jellyfish and octopuses. So yeah, you can actually do, do decent selling. I was doing one, the one year I did that, I sold more in that than I think I did in prints. 
that people really enjoyed. And it was the people who stood and watched while I was doing it. Those were the ones who wanted to purchase it. If I had the ones that I pre-drew, I had left over from la the previous year. I brought them with me to this last Aquashella. They eventually sold, but not as quick. When people watched me do it at these shows, they sold really fast. So that's a, a really cool thing to do if you do art shows where you're sitting there at a booth. It draws attention to your booth too. Okay, let's see. We've got a shadow that comes here and here. I have a whole bunch of little feathers sticking out there too. Uh, it is way easier. Um, Nick and Joseph with the, the Discord questions, that is making it so much easier for me to focus, not paying attention to chat. That was, I, I, until I'm doing this, I see how much that was slowing me down before. Um, I spent so long looking through and reading and scrolling and it, it jumps. YouTube is so bad about their chat jumping as you're scrolling through trying to get everybody. So yeah, this is nice. See, I've got a bit of a sketchy look. I'm going to leave it. I'm, I'm okay. Let's zoom in so you can see that a bit more. But as I get through some of this, don't feel like everything has to be perfectly smooth. If you've got that sketchy, it just looks so cool with charcoal. A question I'm often asked, how do you know when it's done? When I can hang it on my wall and not pick it apart. When I can look at it and be happy, like that's kind of my, my standard is if I hang this right now, am I going to find a million things wrong with it? And what I'll often do, and I will definitely do this on this one, there's a very good chance I'll go spend another five minutes, 10 minutes on it tomorrow after I'm done because I need to come back with fresh eyes. I'll probably notice some random little thing that no one else will notice, but I will. But come back with fresh eyes, spend a few more minutes on something or a couple hours, depending on what your work, this one will only be about 10 minutes, but um, spend a little bit more time. You'll notice things you didn't notice before. But that's pretty much my rule on, am I done? Do I hate it? Am I going to sit and pick it apart? Can I hang this on my wall right now and be proud of it? That's kind of my, my standard for deciding if something is done. I'm going to push harder and really get some of these whites to stand out now. Not all of them. We just have a few spots. I want some of these to be more muted. I love it. We've get this this very sketchy look in there. It's just, I love that about charcoal. I don't know why. Like if, if you're working on a canvas, I don't want to see the tooth of the canvas. If I'm working in colored pencil, I don't want to see the tooth of the paper. I don't know why I love that look with charcoal. It just feels so artsy. Maybe because I'm so used to making everything look more, um, like everything's so clean. And then I'll end up, as long as the person who, who is bidding um, that wins, I'll end uh, if they they actually pay, I'll send this. I always worry about that with auctions. Um, I will send this out on Saturday or s uh, Sunday. It'll be to, it'll be in the mail this weekend so that next week it'll it'll come USPS. Okay, let's go back to we have all these little lines now. Oh, we actually. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let's get some of these white lines in there. The other thing with things being done, don't get to the point where you never finish anything because you always think nothing's ever done. And I, I definitely had students that did that. Sometimes it's just time to move on to the next piece. Now, I don't mean abandon it and never finish things. I've also had those students. Um, you definitely want to get on finish, but don't be such a perfectionist that you never finish anything. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to sort through what's what. That comes down, goes down there. Chicken lips. Actually comes way down. 
And then we've got all the little feathers in here. There we go, much better. Okay, and then we've got some of these little guys that start layering. The detail doesn't need to be perfect. Get those values in there though. I'm gonna hold the pencil to the side a little bit for the bigger chunks. Gives a bit of a softer look. Some of these dots will probably be easier just to, yeah, there we go. Get it with the shading tool. Okay. This area has a lot more with the white. Almost there. We have a lot of these little feathers I'm missing, the little long ones, little specks. Variation in those values. Again, that's, that's really what I'm focusing on at this point. Really paying attention lights and darks. It's not about the detail. I mean, I say that and I'm doing a lot of detail, but not that much really. I mean, look how quick we've done this. We're, I, what, about an hour ago is when I really started in on it, once I was done talking. So getting, it's about your values, your lights and your darks. The detail is not the thing that is going to make your work look more realistic. It's your values. I mean, having accurate detail and having detail, I'm not saying there's no place for it, but if your values aren't there, it doesn't matter how perfect your drawing is. It doesn't matter how perfect your colors, anything else. If your values are wrong, it's, it's, it's a cartoony look. If you want that more realistic look, you want to get those values. Light's light enough, dark's dark enough. And I know I say this over and over again, but it's so important. I really want to want everyone to get that like stuck in their head. Just hear that constantly when you're working. Get those lights light enough, dark's dark enough. And it's scary because when you're making something really dark, that it's like, is it too dark? Am I overdoing this? Usually not. Usually it's not dark enough. I understand wanting to keep it safe, but it's going to look so much better if you start working on getting those values correct. Really hype those up. I want these whites to look lighter, so I darkened what was right next to it. The color of the light is really catching right here. I'm pretty happy because that, what I'm seeing on screen is very, like, I mean, it looks just like what mine in person looks like. That was such a problem. It was one of the reasons I didn't like the live streams. I couldn't get the, the quality there. These new, these are the Elgato cam, uh, they're face cams, and I'm pretty happy with it. They have a newer one I'm going to get, but it's not available yet, so I'll, I'll be upgrading another still. But I, I'm really pleased. This is really accurate to what I'm seeing. I'm going to smudge those out. Now you can really see too what I'm talking about where the initial coming up with the, the base layers, it doesn't look great. It takes the longest amount of time though. Once you get into these little things, these little details, it just starts pulling everything together. If you guys have some subject requests, I can't promise I can get it done in the time of a live stream. So I can't do everything, but if you want to leave some suggestions for what you'd like to see in future live streams, especially charcoal, charcoal and acrylics are going to be the easiest to do where I can complete the lesson. Those are my two fastest mediums by a long shot. Okay, I don't see a ton 
extra that I want to do. I mean, I can sit and fuss over it, but I think I'm getting to that point where I'm going to want to come back with fresh eyes tomorrow and make just a few minor changes. Kind of what I'm doing now, just these little changes will come through and make little adjustments. But I'm definitely getting to that point where I've stared at it for so long that my eyes are getting a bit blurry. So I think that's where I'm going to leave it. I will sign it though. Let's see. So this is two things when I come up with signing my work. Hold on. I'll put this. Now in this case, this is going to be matted. So I need to know where that mat lays. And then I need to figure out, do I want, let's pull this back up. Do I want the signature here? And what I will typically do is hold the pencil about where I might want to sign it. Or do I want it over on this edge? Actually, the camera, you can't really see. Come on. Well, you can kind of see. So here, here, I like it better here. So this is where I want to sign that. Hey, the first painting or drawing of 2023. There we go. Now, when you sign things, notice that this is not along the bottom here. And this is a mistake I see a lot of people make when they sign their work, they sign right here. Well, what happens when you go to put the mat, if you signed at that bottom, you're gonna end up covering, the mat will cover some of that. So that's why I wanted to get that placement of the mat before I signed. You typically, whether it be a painting or anything, you don't want it right along the edge there. So there is our finished piece. I have stuff all over my hands. And before we move on, let's go ahead and get another ad in here because um, this video is sponsored by Patreon. So let's see what, go back to our reviews. Um, did I show this one? I think so good. I didn't even need a cheat. Tom Brady. Okay, so yeah, there there are ads. Um, we've got more coming. Um, let's go on to the question. So we, uh, Nick and Joseph, if you want to start sending in some of the questions, we can do that. And while we wait for that, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and if you are following along and you need to see this finished thing, open this video in a new tab you, and just pause it where I last showed the, the painting. Um, so that'll make it easier for you to keep working on that. But let's go ahead and talk about um, artificial paintings, AI art. That is a, okay, those, they're gonna start sending those in now. Um, it's something that I'm seeing a lot of artists freak out about. So do you, if you don't know what they are, it's essentially you go, you can use an app or a program on the internet and you put in certain keywords like I want a sea turtle with roses and this and that and whatever elements. And then the AI steals essentially photos from, from all over the place and combines them into its own painting. Artists are freaking out that it's going to put them out of business and they're going to lose money. And there's a lot of, there are things I don't like about it. Um, I don't think it's as detrimental to our industry as what a lot of people are making it out to be. Here's the thing. The thing I don't like about it is that they're violating copyright. They may take my paintings. They're just pulling random stuff off the internet. And it is, there is a very, very serious issue with, um, oh, Will I spray this during the stream? stream. Good, I will do that. Um, yes, I will do that at the end. Um, but there is a very serious issue with to me with violating my copyright, taking my stuff and putting it into to another painting. And they're gonna try to do, oh, it's um, fair use or wait, what do they use under fair use? What do they try to claim it's transformative? Yeah, that doesn't work with stealing art. Like that's not really how copyright work, works. It's not as simple. And I see people make that excuse for, for copyright all the time. Oh, it's transformative, I turned your Thing into my thing and it's different now no not how that works but um the you get the if as long as you say change 20 percent of the piece or 20 80 30 40 there's every percentage out there of somebody telling you if you change this much then it's legal no it's it's that's not as simple it, it doesn't really work that way uh, like as artists we always tell you don't copy somebody else's thing if you don't have rights to do it don't just steal photos off the internet so um don't <laughs> looking at what is the hell? What are you doing, Gibson? Um, anyway, focus, Lisa. So that's my main issue with the AI stuff. 
the people who are worried, I've heard stories of somebody wrote a book, a children's book, and they just used AI over the weekend and they didn't have to then hire an artist. They weren't going to hire an artist anyway. Let's be realistic. The person who's going to use AI art, and I'm going to show you some samples in just a moment here. The people who are going to use AI art in a book, in anything else, they were not going to hire a real artist. There is a huge difference in the value you get from artwork created by an artist and from the AI. So let's take a look at some of this. So let's start with my sea turtle. This is one I did recently in colored pencil. Sea turtle, we've got a bird on there. We've got roses. I've got anthias. I've got bees. I've got honeycomb. All this stuff. I actually went and did, me and two of my friends were using different AI programs and because some of them are better than others for sure. And I do think that AI will get to a point where it's better than it is now. It's not so, it's not what people think it is. So I typed in using um, turtle, roses, obviously. Uh, what else did I type in there? Fish, ocean. I don't know. We typed in a few different things trying to get better results. This was probably the best one. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like everything was absolutely terrible. However, the computer has a really hard time understanding how many legs a turtle has or how many legs a lion has, how many legs anything has. It is the most bizarre crap you will come up with with this AI-generated art. It's Things are very deformed, and you'll see some of that coming up. But in this case, like, okay, the idea, you've got roses, you've got turtle. Why are there 800 legs on a turtle? There's very, mm, not cute. So there's that. Here's another one, same... Um, we same prompts with the sea turtle roses and the same thing. We have all these weird legs. So this is when you see people freaking out about that it we're going to lose money as artists and it's going to take our jobs. I'm not afraid. Like this doesn't concern me right now. I'm not saying it won't get to the point where it's amazing, but I'm, we're going to come back into that. I'm going to show you some more samples. So um, let's see, what did we have next? That one is actually for something else. Why is the flamingo there? Um, that, that one was probably the closest. We had to type in roses on a turtle shell with bees, and that one was kind of, but again, you're not talking about something that's comparable. Like, somebody who would buy that as a paint, like, they want to hang that in their wall, is not the person who's going to buy mine. It's just not the same. So I don't think it's something to fear as much as um, that one's kind of better. But again, we've got legs where legs don't go. It's just bizarre on some of those. Some of these, uh, some of the, the the programs are a lot better. I think that was the one my friend has is in beta on. It's not released. It's actually one of the better programs. But it's still not, I'm not worried. Um, this one we typed in so it would look like colored pencil. I'm not afraid. What do we have next? Again, very, like, they're they're more creepy than good. Um, let's see. That one's okay, I guess. Uh, not afraid. Still not afraid. Why is there a fin on the shell? Like, how, I don't understand how, you would think the computers, if they're supposed to be so good at this and people are so afraid, this is what you get. So, yeah. Um... Okay, and we're using the same prompts for most of these. Um, I think we looked at that one already. I must have had that in there twice. I get fins. Why are there fins all in the weirdest location? Okay, so next we have the flamingo. Hold on one second. Um, we did this for three paintings. This turtle we did the most of. Uh, we just couldn't find anything that made the, the sea turtle work. Uh, I've got to close these. Hold on one second. This is not a high-tech... There we go. Flamingo with octopus. Flamingo standing in water with octopus in water. Flamingo standing in the ocean. We used so many prompts trying to get anything that could compete with mine. Nothing even close. I mean, they were just... I don't know what that one is. Again, we come, a lot of these are very creepy. This is the app that my friend has, and it's able to make it look better than some of the other ones, but it's still... It's more creepy than... 
than good. We actually had fun. Yeah, we were laughing. This was just funny to to see what it was doing. But it's also funny because seeing how many artists are kind of having meltdowns of it's the end of the world. It's the end of our industry. People aren't hiring artists anymore. They weren't going to hire you. If they're okay, if somebody is okay with that, that person was not going to hire you anyway. It's not something to be afraid of. So yeah, um, let's see. Next we have my, we tried the same thing with the lion with coral. And th that was, we were looking at more of the surreal stuff because saying like a bird drinking out of a cup, that's a little bit easier to find. So, and even that tends to look creepy, but we were trying some of the more surreal stuff. So that one, I don't, I don't know. I think that one was still on the sea turtle and lion. We mixed a few different things on that one. Yeah. So did the computer. Why does the sea turtle have an arm and a lizard head? Like it's very, it's, it's, it's a thing. Um, we have, let's see, what did we have next? That one, at least it's coral. We did the lion with a coral mane. It kind of, but again, I'm not afraid. This is not competition. This is not concerning to me at all. This is interesting to me. Look at the legs. And this is very common with AI stuff. Very creepy. Yeah, yeah, what Paul said. It, it's funny, but it still feels wrong. Exactly. They're, they're, they're more eerie than anything else. Could you use it in a book? Yeah, I'm probably not going to buy your book. Um, that's weird. Now, we are also seeing where a lot of artists are coming into our Facebook group or our MeWe group, and they're try we're trying to actually removed a few people recently for it, kept posting AI stuff claiming it was their new painting. I can tell when it's AI. It's not hard to tell. And especially when you've got a pattern where I can see your old work and suddenly now yours has this look. No, it's AI. Like you do have people lying about stuff. So that is a thing. But one of the things we have, have to remember, the people who are going to buy this are not the people who are going to buy your paintings. You're not going out of business. The other thing is throughout history, every time there's some new technological advancement, people have meltdowns. It's going to ruin art. People aren't going to buy art because when the camera was invented, no one was going to buy paintings anymore because the camera, we still do paintings. Creatives are going to create. Nothing is going to stop us. If I'm not making money, I'm still going to be drawing things. I mean, that's what I do. I, it's, there's like a, a drive in us that we need to create. From the beginning of time, we've been creating things. We always will. Did the camera change the environment? Did it change things? Sure. But it doesn't necessarily mean bad or that it's going to completely go out. Now, there are some industries like lettering that people used to do on signs like our doors and signage and stuff. Yeah, the modern way that we do things, we did lose that. But it's not something that is so like end of the world. You're not going to make paintings of every time something new comes. So we had that. We had digital painting. That was another big one. Everyone's like, oh, there, there's not going to be any use for oils and acrylics. No one's going to use those anymore. Or when acrylics were invented, people were saying, no one's going to do oil paintings anymore. You will always have, every time there's something new, people kind of have a meltdown. And in the end, it doesn't hurt. It, it didn't affect anything. Not really. So it's certainly not thing, something to really, what else was it? Oh, that was another one that, um, a lot of artists were concerned when the cheap, like mass produced stuff that they used to sell in front of grocery stores and such of cheap stuff out of China, that like just mass produced art. Well, it was going to affect art. People who are buying that art are not the people who are buying original, like from an artist art. It, it's not the same group of people. So it's really not affecting me if somebody goes and buys something cheap. Posters were a big one. Everyone thought when you got posters, they weren't going to need paintings anymore. They can just get prints. The people who are buying prints are not the same people who are going to buy the original. Like, it's a very different thing. So I'm, the point is, I just don't think anyone needs to be super concerned about this. I don't like the copyright issue, and I would like to see some legal action taken against some of these that are stealing, because they are stealing stuff from artists. That I have an issue with. But as far as, like, putting me out of business or people aren't going to hire an artist to illustrate a book anymore, the people who are, are using AI stuff weren't going to hire you. It, it, they're not the same group of people. And chances are somebody who is using AI, like I just, I have a feeling their book probably wasn't very good anyway. And that's already been happening for years. Not AI, but more Photoshop stuff. We see it all the time. There's a book I'm li listening or reading right now. I'm not listening to that one, but it's like a dragon writing book. And the girl they used on the front doesn't look like the girl in the book. The dragon isn't even the right size. It doesn't look anything like what's described in the book. It's this weird, creepy Photoshop together 
together from like here's some of this of a dragon and this is of a girl and we're going to change her head so it doesn't even look like it's attached right weird creepy it's not well done this was not somebody who because she was able to do it in photoshop like she didn't hire you that's not this is somebody who the book's not amazing her artwork's not nothing about it's amazing like the, her standard of quality it, i think it was a female author not all there so i i again not super concerned and i'm not even like i actually had friends that were telling me and this is how the conversation kind of started why don't you use ai to get ideas for your paintings because my ideas are better you saw that the sea turtle was such a good example of that their construction of things aren't anywhere near my level of creativity it's a computer. There is a difference, believe it or not. Some of them, I kind of liked the color palette, maybe for that, but I didn't even see anything that of every single thing. We tried so many prompts of different things, not just that, not even just surreal stuff. We tried so many things. There wasn't a single one that I was like, oh, I want to paint that. Not one. And I'm talking hundreds. We went through, it's, we were ha actually having a blast. They're fun to play with. But yeah, I just don't think that these are some, this is something that any of us really need to be super concerned with other than the copyright issue that I do have problems with. Okay, let's go. We've only got 20 more minutes if you are going to bid. And let's see, questions. Okay, just looking to see where we were. Okay, Rob said, I heard or asked, let's let's reword that again so when I edit this, it'll be easier. Rob asks, nope, let's try that one more time. Rob said, I heard there is a setting to prevent Adobe from using your work for their AI. It's on by default. I have no idea about that. That's interesting. But even with them, it would, you're talking about keeping them from the AI using your, wouldn't it just keep... Adobe from using it because I think a lot of these these app creators are going to be shady honestly I don't think we're talking about they're just looking for a quick buck to sell their app um, some are free but they're just full of ads they're just looking they, I just don't feel like a lot of these app developers some of them are not all of them are legitimate and I don't think all of them are going to care where they pull that image and so I don't know I'm I would like more information on that I really don't know so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Paul says, originality never goes out of style. There's something unique to you. And there is an interesting conversation to be had about the AI text-to-speak thing or text where they can write something and it sounds like you wrote it. Like they, you'll tell it, tell, you know, tell a story about and you put in your prompts and it comes up and it searches the internet for that and it'll word it. It can sound like you. Some of them are really good. It's becoming a problem apparently for colleges or schools because students are using this and writing papers that are not really by them. So that's... And like, I can see where there are some issues with this sort of technology, but overall, it's just not a, a big deal. So do we have any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Let's see. I'm actually curious. Where, where are we on? Oh, look, hounds are moving. Um, I wanted to see. There we go. Very cool. Okay, here we go. We've got a question. Nancy said, I'm completely ignorant about pastels, colored pencils, etc. Are pan pastels an option to use with charcoal like the background? Yeah, you could certainly use them with it. I've not because it's kind of weird. Like, okay, pan pastels could be used for a background for anything. Um, I, for pastels, for colored pencil, you could use them for charcoal. It would be kind of weird. That could be unique, though. That could be an interesting style to do. But yeah, you can use the pan pastels and then put charcoal on top for sure. So I don't think there was anything else. I, I Oh, wait, we've got more coming in. Oh, whoa, weird. This has a pop-up on the app. I did that on accident. I hit a button and it did something weird. Okay. Skylar says, what do you do to get back into the rhythm or sync with painting after not painting for a long time? You, you have to force yourself to do it. You, you, a lot of us sit around waiting. That's a great question. A lot of us will sit around waiting for this inspiration or the mood to strike us to want to paint or draw. It's not going to happen. Like, 
you, what is it they say? Inspiration finds you working. So, or for us, it would be inspiration finds you at the easel. You're going to get up to, and go to the easel when you don't want to. You're not in the mood. You may have to set a certain amount of time. I'm going to draw for 15 minutes, for 20 minutes. It's just going to be a quick sketch. Whatever it is, maybe do that once a day, twice a day, whatever. Just do something short. But you have to start doing it. The more you paint and draw, the more you're going to just be kind of sucked into it and want to, to draw more. The more you do it, the more you get into it. It's very similar. Like we just started eating healthy again after like a three month binge of Oreos. I've eaten a lot of gluten-free double stuffed Oreos. My clothes don't fit anymore. Anyway, I'm now the last few days back to, okay, back on the let's eat healthy train. I feel so much better already. But I also am having a very hard time because it's new. I want to eat those double stuffed gluten-free Oreos. That was the best and worst invention that could have ever happened to me. But I have you have to force yourself to do something. In this case, it would be so much easier to eat than to fight the, the desire. And I'm going to not want to eat healthy for the next two weeks. Like it's a very hard thing to get back. It's the same thing with the gym, getting into the gym. I don't want to go on a walk. I don't want to go work. I don't go to the gym. I walk the dogs. But I don't want to go do it most of the time. I have to make myself, okay, tomorrow, 12 o'clock, I'm going on a walk. I have to make that decision and just go do it. And the same thing with art. And one of the things that a lot of people will kind of get in the habit of, or or think of is that you don't if you're not in the mood to draw or if you're having to force yourself to do it then you're not meant to do it like it's supposed to be this religious experience between whatever I don't know but people want to pretend art is something more than what it is it's like this romanticized idea it's not if you want to draw you're going to go sit down and draw yeah you may have a day where things are just not quite going right but for the most part especially for realism you're just going to go do it. Just sit down and do it. So don't, um, don't wait for that inspiration. Don't wait to be in the mood. Go to the easel. Set a schedule though. I think that's the easiest thing is to set a time. Okay. Tomorrow night, 7 PM. I'm going to go spend 30 minutes. I'm going to go sketch. It doesn't even have to be anything big. Just going to get started. And the more you do it, same thing with eating healthy. The longer I do it, the more I do it, the easier it gets. And the more I'm kind of, I'll, I'll knowing me, I get obsessed with it and then I won't eat anything bad. So I, I'm all or nothing. But the our art is very, very much the same. You just have to force yourself sometimes. And that can be the case for anything. It can be music. You may love playing the violin, but if you don't sit down and practice and force yourself to do it, you just kind of fall out of the habit and you, you, it, it's hard to get back into. You have to force yourself. Set a schedule. Okay, next. Um... CI said, are the reference photos the scale of what you're drawing or do you have multiple zoom in areas like the eye getting detail, also printed photo or on a tablet? So if you look, I think it shows, if you look on Instagram, I posted it there and on MeWe, the, a quick like you can kind of see the studio. I've got a very large computer. I think it's 27 inch. 32 inch maybe it's a 32 I don't know it's on the bigger side of a monitor that's up on my wall and it's attached to a small one of my really old laptops that doesn't do almost anything else well besides show an image and I zoom in and out so I like that better printing you've got to have a good printer if you print the work it's nice because you can put it like right on your easel next to it and you're looking right side by side. So there is a convenience there but I find that the color the values everything is just more likely to be off I maybe because I don't have a good printer but I definitely prefer having it on a computer screen where I can zoom in and out as I want. So that is my, my choice there. Um, and I think that that would show, you should be able to see that on that. I think it showed a little bit. You can see the Kestrel on there. Um, and as far as the scale, no, that's actually way bigger than the artwork is because I'm zoomed in so far. Let's see. Next question. Um, Started watching and learning from you about seven years ago. This year, I will travel to Japan to study art. Wanted to thank you for the tips during the years. That is awesome. That is so cool. Paul said, have you tried Faber-Castell's new pit graphic mat? It promises to have less shine as the regular graphite as it, it, it is as matte as the charcoal. I've not tried those, but I have tried, there's one brand that they have a matte pencil and it's kind of somewhere between, it's weird unless you're using an entire set that are matte. 
I would be interested in trying them, but the one other brand, I never got super excited about it because the only other brand I've used, I'm like, this is really just a mixture of graphite and carb and charcoal. Like it wasn't, it wasn't graphite. It was too smudgy. It was, it was weird, but this may not be the same. No, I've not tried it. I, I'm just making assumptions and I really need to order some and find out. Definitely need to do a review on that. Let's see. Another question. Um, have you tried pastel matte paper for colored pencils, charcoal and pen pastel? I love it. It can take a lot of layers. So I've used it for colored pencil a couple of times and I also loved it. I need to do it for pan pastels for sure. I just found it when I was looking for something else recently and remembered I need to try that because I love that stuff. So yeah, I definitely want to. I I've only used it for colored pencils and it was amazing. It, OMS and colored plant pencil blended like the results I got were just so rich, so fast. It was a very fast meeting, paper to work on. So that was really cool. I do want to do that. Um, Glenn said, do you like charcoal or graphite better to use? Oh, that's a hard one. I like the almost instant gratification of charcoal because it's so fast. With graphite, I'm going to take a lot longer. Graphite, though, it's easier if you want like super fine, fine detail. If I want something to look like a black and white photo, I'm going to go with graphite. If I want that more sketchy look, now, again, charcoal can get the black and white photograph look. It depends on the paper you're using and the time you put it. It depends on all that stuff. But charcoal can do that. It's just I find it easier. I like working in graphite better for that. And then when I want something that is just has the softer blending and, and all of that. I really like the charcoal for that. So it definitely depends on what my project is and how much time I want to put into it. Um, let's see. We've got a few more minutes if we've got any more questions you want to send in. That cup is really hard to drink out of. Um, Will you put on back of this piece or anywhere that this is your first creation of 2023? No, that's not really something that I, no. Um, I don't write anything. I know some people put little messages and stuff on the back of the artwork. I don't do that at all. Um, Elaine said, I think it would be others to see the style. Wait, actually, I can scooch over here now. Um, I think it would be others to see the style than you would like like it can tell oh I'm not sure what that I, I think that's not anything to do with me um here we go somebody else is paying attention to questions do you still have your jumping spider not the same one I actually have two different ones right now one's molting I hope he comes out of it they don't always have good molts um that's just nature and life but yeah I currently have a black one uh, he's a, a bold jumping spider and then I've got a gray another gray one so the other one she lived out around they don't live very long so and I don't know how old she was when I had found the first one but no I have two different ones now also that I found actually I both I found them both the same day this summer so yeah uh let's see Jack said I just wanted to ask do you find you need to sometimes take a break to rest your eyes doing art as mine sometimes get blurry and can't focus. Oh my gosh, yes, all the time. That's actually one of the main reasons I kind of stopped on this. I mean, I'd, I'd only wanted to work on it for about an hour, but my eyes are starting to get blurry for sure. If I don't take the time to look away, so my biggest tip for you, this is what the eye doctors told me, is to look across the room out, like if you've got an open window and you can look out at a tree across the yard, look 20 feet away or more if possible and do that for like, 30 seconds or so. Just really let your eyes rest. If you sit too close and you're right up against the easel like I am and not looking at a distance, not relaxing your eyes, you will cause some damage, like pretty bad. So make sure you're looking across the room regularly. But absolutely, even when I am do, I didn't do that tonight. I should. But when I do a good job of paying attention to that sort of thing, I absolutely end up um, very, very blurry eyes. Like usually at, at night after, like right before bed, my husband and I will go and watch shows. Like we, Sweet Tooth was really good, by the way. You should watch that if you haven't on Netflix. But it will go watch something like that. And I can't even read. If there are uh, subtitles at all, I can't read them. I can't read them easily anyway because my, just my eyes, but like everything's just blurry. Like it's hard to make out people, let alone anything else if I've been, if I've really stressed them at the easel for too many hours. Cause I'll sit here for five, six hours straight and not get up. So yes, absolutely. They do get blurry. Um, let's see. Um,
horsewoman said, what size paper was the kestrel done on? This one is a, the paper itself, I believe, is a 9 by 12, but the, where it gets blocked off, it's going to be matted down to an 8 by 10, and then the mat itself is an 11 by 14. So it'll fit into an 11 by 14 frame. And yeah, but I'm pretty sure this is actually a 9 by 12. Let's see, we've got a text from, from everyone's favorite Conejo. I don't know if that's gonna be safe to read. Let's see, it's my little app. This is weird, this little pop-up Discord app. Um, oh, I can read this. For once, he wrote something appropriate. Congratulations on your comeback, Lisa. I love your new format. The hound cam, you look great. All those things you said about the AI, it's all true, take care. <laughs> um, let's see, whoops come back this little pop-up discord thing is kind of handy see we're trying all kinds of new things today i don't even know what, what i'm doing yet with all the new toys um let's see we've got dale said dale asks is there any advice that you can give in choosing the mat as you did with the kestrel thank you Usually I go with black. I just keep it simple. The buyer can always change it if they want to. Black is normally safe. However, there are times where it just like draws attention, especially graphite where you don't have darks quite as dark as the mat. Then I might use a white mat or a different color, but I will often take the artwork with me to like Michael's. They'll have, I think Michael's does, I know Hobby Lobby does, but take it to an art supply store and try different mats on it and see what will look best. When I sell mine, I just buy bulk, a big bunch of the black ones. Um, you can get them from, it's Golden State Art. I think they sell on Amazon now, but I just get a bunch from them. Um, and black is normally going to be the safe way to go. But there there are times where black just does not look good. Like the black will pull too much attention. And that can happen with any color. Like there are some colors that will make you notice the matte instead of the artwork. So you don't want that. The matte should make the artwork look better. If it's making it so that all you notice is the matte, you know that is not the right choice. So I will usually try to find a matte that has colors that are in the piece. So obviously here, the black and white or a black matte is is easy. That's a, that's a given. But let's say I did something that was mostly pinks. Black might not be the choice. Something else that's closer to pink or cream or white, that might be better. But I will take the, the artwork with me to an art store where I can try it on. Or if you are cutting your own mats, which is certainly a possibility, if you're doing that, you have a lot of matte, uh, the paper at home, you can just kind of set it on the different colors to see what looks good. Uh, let's see. Dragonfly said, I would like to know the process cost to copyright one's work. Thanks, Lisa. I don't do it. Technically, as soon as you've painted or drawn something, it is copyrighted to you. Now, the challenge comes, let's say somebody copied your work and you have to go to court and do all of that. If you haven't actually gone through the process of copywriting it, it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge for you to prove that was mine. I did it first. In my case, these are all up on YouTube. There's a date. It's easy. I'll this kestrel though that's another thing is in this case i'm using an image that tons of people have access to like it was just a free one from i think this one was pixabay so other people are going to draw the same thing or you guys could have drawn it and i'm not going to claim copyright on any of that we all had access to the same reference photo plus i was showing you how to do it so that's going to be a little bit different but let's say somebody did something like my lion with a coral mane and i have seen some people copy that and try to play it off as their own but whatever um the work was bad enough i'm not i'm not scared it was kind of like an ai trying to do my work but that's what you get i'm gonna be rude when you copy my stuff and you're trying to sell it as your own anyway moving on so the um the, where was I going with that? The copyright. Actually having your work copyrighted is kind of expensive. I forget what it was. God, was it like $35, $40? I don't know. It would be more now because everything's more now. But you can do a, a save money by doing it as a series. So let's say I did a series of charcoal. Like all my charcoal drawings were fell into a series for 2022 or whatever. I could say that's a series and name it something and, and copyright the entire lot of them for less. There are ways that you can copyright and save money. I've never actually gone through the process of copywriting anything. Maybe I'm dumb. I just feel like because all of mine is 
you can look back at the date on YouTube when this was uploaded and see when mine was created. You can actually watch me creating it. So I've not personally gone through the trouble of doing it. And especially early on, most artists were very similar to where I was. The starving artist thing was a very real term. Like that was a thing. And uh, there's no way I could spend money on painting something like I have to buy the supplies and then I have to pay to copyright. Like I didn't have the money. But luckily, at least here in the U.S., it once you painted it, it's technically already copyrighted to you. It's just proving that can be a challenge if you ever needed to in court. So that's where having it like officially copyrighted is better. But technically, if it's yours, it's yours. Okay. Um... Nikki said, I have used Faber-Castell Gold Faber Aqua Pencil. Oh, have you used? What do you think? I've not. No, I've not used those. So that I don't have an opinion on. Jack said, how do you find YouTube as a platform? Has it gotten better or worse over the years from when you began? Far, far worse. Far worse. Like we've all gotten better at making videos. We've got better equipment now. The quality is better. It's easier for somebody just getting into it to get better quality like camera equipment for fairly inexpensive compared to what some of that used to be. I like that. But that's not really YouTube as a platform. That's just technology in general. YouTube as a platform, their algorithm is horrible. And this is really comes down to one of the problems that I've been having. So, you know, if, if you watched my live streams before, I stopped a year ago. I was going to focus on the edited content because that performs better on YouTube or it can perform. Live streams were hurting. YouTube wants you to do live streams, but then they punish your channel as a whole. Your whole channel gets punished because people are watching a smaller percentage of a live stream. It's a two-hour stream. Most people are going to watch 10, 15 minutes. So if the, the shorter amount of time people watch, the more my whole channel gets, pu gets punished as, well, people aren't staying around very long. They must not want to watch your other stuff either. So that's why I stopped doing it in order to focus on edited content. But what happened to me last, last what was it, the end of March, beginning of April, I got COVID. No big deal. It was mild, I mean, at this point. So... But it really hit my fibromyalgia, got really angry. It just took me a while to get back in the swing of things. I was really tired. So it, I had like a month, two months where I wasn't doing edited content. I did my Patreon videos, but I wasn't doing my edited content. I think I took two weeks off on Patreon, but I didn't do my edited stuff on YouTube. And that alone killed my channel killed it. I can't get views on anything because they're not suggesting it. And this isn't just me. This is, it turns out, is a YouTube thing. There's no way to take a break. Like you go on vacation, you better have videos ready to go. If you take any bit of a break, the longer you go without people watching your stuff, which obviously you're not producing stuff, they're not watching it, but they, it start, they stop suggesting your content. The other problem that I have with YouTube right now is they... So they used to, like, let's say I searched oil paintings and I'll search that because I want to get ideas like for, for like, oh, well, how are other people making videos? Maybe I'll get some ideas there. I will do a search and it will show me nine or eight. I forget what it was based on the search oil paintings or oil paintings of whatever. Then it'll give me related to search with like seven or eight. I forget how many. I counted it the other day. And then it moves on to... I, funny, they want me to play an ad now. I will play an ad for you in just a moment, um, but not theirs. Anyway, they will then move on to uh, sponsored or another type of suggested. I forget. They worded it something else. It's the same thing. It's just they're only showing you nine things you searched for, the top nine. What happened? You used to be able to go through hundreds of pages. You know how many oil painting videos are on there. So it makes it very hard. It doesn't matter if you're established or if you're new. It makes it very, very hard for people to find your content if they're not, if YouTube isn't, like you're not one of their darlings, they're, they're shoving up at the top of the list. Very difficult to find. And it's frustrating to me. Like this was when I got the, the whole Elgato, the way that I'm changing my camera views and all of this now is through the Steam Deck. And I was looking for videos on how, like just tips and stuff. It showed me nine and then suggested other things that were kind of related, but it's not what I was searching for. The Google they, owns them. They are a search company. This is what they are supposed to be the best at. And they're no longer serving me as a user, not as a creator. As a user, my complaint is I can't find what I'm looking for on YouTube. And it's funny because I have YouTube premium, so I don't have ads anymore. I can't, you would think like I will, I'm more willing because I don't have to sit through an ad to watch small creators and see if they're making good stuff. They won't show it to me. They, and it's not just small, anyone. They're limiting so heavily what we see. So as a creator, and then coming back from the other side, because you know, I do both. As a creator, 
it's really difficult right now. People are just not seeing a lot of what we produce and it's very, very difficult. Like once and taking that break when I had COVID, it just knocked my channel down and it w they made it very hard for me to have, find the motivation to edit a video. So editing the videos, the way I was doing it, the fully edited, like all the B roll, all the, it takes so long. It got to the point where it was like either I produce art or I nonstop them in a, a video editor. I had to choose one. And that's where I'm like, I'm going to go back to live streams and then I'll just edit these down into, to edit the content. But it was, it was very hard to find the motivation to do it when it's like they're not going to show it to anyone anyway. I pretty, I made some videos last year that were really good, like should have performed well. If I had uploaded them five years ago, they would have taken off. YouTube didn't show them to anybody. So yeah, you, you we'll take some blame on our own for sure. Maybe the content, maybe my video is just not as good as I think it is. My thumbnails always been a weak spot for me. Um, the uh, titles definitely could use some improvement. So I'm not saying that none of it is my fault, but those things didn't matter so much before. Now it's everything and it sucks. It, it really makes it difficult to get views at this point. It's very, it's been very frustrating for sure. So yeah. And it's not just me. I mean, I, one of my friends is, is friends, like good friends with one of the bigger art YouTubers. Like he has over a million. He was one of the first really big art YouTubers. Um, and he, that person was saying, you can't make any money anymore can't get views, can't make money, making, trying to do the same stuff. You just, it's very, and I understand you say, well, don't make the same stuff. That's the thing we have to evolve. We have to make ourselves better. And I agree with that, but nothing seems to be working at this point. It's, it is very frustrating. So, I mean, that's why you're going to see me. I, I've realized I have to start, um, my income, because I'm not getting views on YouTube, my in, my Patreon is is not doing as well. Everything's kind of taking a dive. That's why you're going to see me promoting that a bit more. I've got to get it in front of people. So that's in the, the biggest thing you can do for me or any other creator you like, no matter what kind of video they're sharing, is share it. Share it on Facebook if you use that crap platform. MeWe if you use a good platform. Um, whatever you use, share it with people. Hit like, leave comments. That sort of thing really, really helps. That's the best thing you can do for us. So yeah, it's frustrating. Speaking of ads we should have another one here let's see um ron swanson says my woodworking has never been better that one was actually good got five stars on that one and one last patreon ad matt clow husband says bet she won't ask me for my help again So yeah, there are my ads. Um, speaking of Patreon, if you aren't already subscribed, head over there for as little as $4 a month. You get access to all of my longer three hour or long three, what? No, that wasn't right at all. All of my longer over 300, I have over, none of that's coming out right. I give up patreon.com slash luckery. You'll see all the rewards. There's some good, good stuff over there. Um, everything from more advanced drawings to more basic, uh, simple stuff. So lots of stuff over there for you. Anyway, um, we are good. That is it for today. Thank you guys so much for joining. And I will get this edited and uploaded like the, the smaller clips and all of that. If you're, if you're coming in late and you want to watch the rest of it, you'll have to use the link from social media or somewhere, wherever you found it. My website will be on there because this, this video has to go unlisted because of the way the YouTube algorithm works. Good times, good times. So that is our finished project. The hounds say good night. We've got some more adjustments or more improvements coming soon for these live streams. Let me know too if you want to send a message or an email or whatever. Let me know if you think there were things you'd like to see more of. Just give me your opinion. I want these these live streams to be fun for. I mean, it's it's fun for me, but I guess it's more useful if it's what you like because you know you're watching and all. Anyway, thank you guys so much, and I will see you next Wednesday. I don't know what we're doing next Wednesday. You should let me know what you want us to see. What you want us to see? I'm tired. I'm going to bed.